Hey, welcome to another edition of Kyle Meredith with. It's the interview series presented by WFPK at WFPK.org, Consequence, and the Consequence Podcast Network. Thanks, as always, for making your way here and checking out the series. Of course, you know what to do. If you like what you see, what you hear, hit that subscribe button. I put out three new interviews every single week, so it's a great way to keep up with your favorite artists. And I am so excited today to welcome back Bethany Cosentino with her debut solo album, Natural Disaster. Hello. Hi, how are you? I'm well. So here we are. You're solo these days. Of course, everybody we we used to know you as part of Best Coast, but this is different. Uh, I, I do. I just want to throw out the congratulations because what a fantastic first statement that you've made. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, it's it's really exciting. It's like, you know, I've been working on this record. I started really working on this record in 2021. So it's been quite a long time. And it's very wild to me that it's finally here. Yeah. Yeah. Especially to have to sit on, like, not just to sit on an album, because I know you've had to do that before, you know, whatever the machine, but to sit on something that's such a statement. Is that a fair way to say it? To sit on a secret, really, because I didn't tell, I, I was very intentional about keeping this record under wraps until it was time to you know, announce it and sort of get ready to dive into the album cycle. I really wanted to allow myself the opportunity to kind of just be invisible and make a record without any external pressure. And it, it obviously like, you know, people know me as Bethany from Best Coast, but nobody really knew me as, nobody knows me as Bethany Cosentino on her own. So it was almost like getting to be a brand new artist again, just going into the studio and like making, just figuring out who I was and what my sound was going to be and what I wanted to say. And I'm so glad that I did it that way. But yeah, as time went on, I was like, oh my God, I, I can't keep this secret one day longer. And so now that it's like finally here, I'm like, oh my God, okay, we did it. <laughs> it's interesting. I've heard you say that, you know, before, if it's another interview or the press release or whatever, but, but you talk about how you know, you feel like your image was so wrapped up in Best Coast and here we get to know you. Maybe it's my perception, but I see you as this icon of especially oh this last decade. <laughs> and I mean, I mean, for me, the way, you know, it's like, yes, I love Best Coast. I, I love the, the music that you've made at Best Coast. Uh, and, and I obviously love what you're doing right now too. But, but I, I think for me, it felt like you had sort of, I don't want to say transcended because I don't want to sell the band short in any way either. But but there was this thing, and maybe that's what it was always building up to. I mean, I, I know that's sort of always a weird thing to comprehend on yourself. But when I talk about this icon status, like you've got your heroes. I saw you, I saw the video of you on stage with uh, with Paramore, and, and that feels like that was certainly part of it. Did you feel like that was sort of part of your profile? You know, I think I have a very difficult time accepting that I am a person in this industry, number one, that I've been around as long as I have, and number two, that I, I mean, Haley Williams of Paramore is a really good friend of mine, and I met her when she was like 19. It was like right as crazy for you was coming out, and she's a person that I consistently go to when I'm feeling like horrible imposter syndrome or anxiety about whatever. And I messaged her recently and I was just like, I'm so like, I don't know what I'm doing. Da, da, da. And she like says to me, she's like, you're literally an icon. You created an entire sound. Like you are, you are really, you were like the it girl of 2010. And I don't feel that way about mm -hmm. myself when somebody, and when Haley Williams says it to me, I'm like, maybe it's true, <laughs> but you know, I have a difficult time. Um, I've always been pretty insecure in that way but also I think I'm just I'm humble like when people say that to me I really am like thank you so much that means a lot to me but I would never like walk around being like hey I'm the indie rock girl of 2010 you know but I do think that like I I feel like the the pivot to make this record and to step out on my own and kind of start a whole new chapter of my career really just came from a place of like I started to really feel like I had outgrown myself. And I that's not something that I necessarily expect other people to like understand because it's such a personal thing. 
but it really did start to feel like I was just like, I don't feel like this person anymore. And I need to go discover who I am now, knowing that like, I can always return to that place or that person, you know, persona, I think is probably a better word for it. Um, if and when I want to. So I feel really grateful to be even in a position where like my debut solo record gets time and attention because of the career that I've built for myself over, you know, almost 15 years. Cause most people like I've been doing so much press around this record and I keep thinking to myself, like you're a, you know, this is like, you're a technically a new artist. Like most new artists don't get to do this much stuff. So I am so grateful for sort of the thing that I've created for myself. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, when we talk about personal growth and putting it out there in arts in, in music, in a record like this, you know, I, I'm I'm thinking a little bit about to one of our last interviews, and and maybe it was the last album, but at that moment in time, that was a part of the story as well. You know, mm -hmm. that was you, and that was your growth in that moment. And it's hard to see what it is in the present, and then you know, there's so much about, of course, hindsight that that we can yeah back from that. But I guess that's one of those things, like like not doubting you whatsoever, because I think it's very obvious in the lyrics that we're hearing here. But why is this different than than in the past when that was such a big part there? Other, you know, beyond the fact that you're older, time has passed. Well, I think that, you know, the the real sort of um the birthplace of the idea to make this record really came after Always Tomorrow. You know, Always Tomorrow came out at the beginning of 2020. We were out on tour for two weeks and then COVID came and everything shut down. And we kept trying to like be like, okay, we'll reschedule, we'll go do this. I'll do like, you know, solo Instagram live, whatever. And it just really started to feel like, I don't think I'm supposed to be doing this anymore. Like I'm a huge, I'm a huge, like it's a sign kind of person. And I really do believe that everything happens for a reason. And I really just felt like the universe was sort of pushing me in a direction of like, you have a desire to expand as an artist. And I think that the, the message of always tomorrow also really felt like it was me sort of doing a lot of soul searching in terms of the things that very much represented Best Coast, which was, you know, unhealthy relationships. Um, you know, I was a bit of a partier. There was like a lot of stuff that I was discovering about myself, but it felt very tethered to the Bethany of Best Coast. And with this, I really was intentional about looking at the world through as kind of what I said in the beginning, like through brand new eyes, like the eyes of a person that's like, this isn't Best Coast, this is Bethany. And I don't even have to think about the past relationships. I don't have to think about the angst that I used to write about. Like, I don't have to think about that version of myself and my healing. I can think about being a totally different person. And I think that this record is also really like a commentary on the state of the world and the way in which I'm dealing with it. And I hope that it inspires other people to sort of like lean into the idea that like, yeah, everything around us is pretty messy and chaotic and it's very scary, but there's also so much magic and joy in the world. And if you just sort of walk through it with that, you know, it's important not to be like Pollyanna, but also like to just plug into those moments when and if possible. And I think that with Best Coast, even the last record, like, yeah, I was on a healing sort of spiritual journey, but like, I was still talking about being like a super angsty, depressed person. And with this, it's like, I don't feel like that person anymore. And I don't know if it was maybe just the formula of what I did as Best Coast and the stories that I told was very tethered to that side of myself. Whereas this is very like, it doesn't even feel like the same thing. Yeah. 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 And you've got great lines on it. I mean, uh, imagine if I handled this shit like I used to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, that's a perfect example. And that song was, that song was inspired by like something that I had seen on the internet that really pissed me off. And I was like, it, it was so, I had my phone in my hand and I was ready to like, just go off. And then I like really sat with myself and I was like, you know who would have gone off on the internet is 25 year old Bethany. What does 35 year old Bethany want to do? She's going to pick up the acoustic guitar and she's going to sit and she's going to write a little song about evolution and how like, we don't, we don't go to that place anymore. You know? And I think that like, 
the record is obviously a lot. It is a self, -dis I would say it's a coming of age self-discovery story, but I think it's the self-discovery story of like a woman in her mid thirties being like, what, what is the rest of my life going to look like, particularly with the landscape behind me of like, you know, political upheaval, police brutality, climate change, women's rights being stripped from them. Like there is so much noise going on in the background. And this was really me being like, how do I, and also love, you know, humanity as a whole, like, how do we make sense of these things? And really it's like, for me, it was about like exploring ideas of love. And that's like with Best Coast, I would have never been like, you know, I want to have a kid or I'm sitting in my car thinking about how easy it is. Like my partner just is so easy to love. And I feel so easy to love. Like Best Coast was always like, you know, like there was like a wall and I was like, you cannot come in. But with this, I was like, here you go, here I am. We're gonna be vulnerable as hell because what do we have to lose? Yeah, I mean, even seeing a song that you, the, a song with the title Easy. I yeah. Mean, there it is right there. I was, um, uh, I'm injecting myself now into the interview. I was, uh, when me and my wife first got together, I think that was a line we kept telling ourselves is because we'd gone through all the relationships that we all went through. Yeah. And I said, you know, it doesn't have to be hard. Mm -hmm. Like it can be easy. Like, you yeah. know, find the right person. It's just easy. Yeah. And, you know, I think that even like, I think also for me, I didn't really ever realize that because I would say that like my relationship is challenging because it's very real. So it's like, there is a lot of moments where I have to be extra vulnerable, where I have to like acknowledge that I messed up and I have to take accountability. My partner has to take accountability all of my relationships in my 20s were very just like it, they were chaotic and fueled by like you know all of the you know unhealthy stuff that i think most people go through in their 20s but like it, and that felt so hard to me but when i look at that i'm like that actually was a walk in the park because it wasn't real and while yes it was unhealthy it didn't require so much of me in the same way that this does. But even though this is challenging, it's like an easy challenging. I wrote in the liner notes like a little, I love like, I'm I'm such a, I like, you know, I grew up buying records and CDs. And so when I do album packaging, I take it super seriously. And I'm still the person that wants to put all the lyrics and thank you notes and all this stuff. And I wrote a little message to my partner in there. Where I was like, you know, you really do make it easy even when it isn't. And I think that that is kind of like, what we all deserve in a partner is a person that we can be with who does make us feel good. But also when times are tough, you can still, it's not like they're going to like, you know, call you a psycho and lock you out of the house, which has happened to me before. <laughs> My God, that's in the rear view. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, and, and by the way, thank you for, for, thank you really seriously. Thank you for thinking about liner notes still. Um, when I was a kid, I was the one who, crack the CD package open pull yeah. up and read it all these names that I wondered if I would ever even figure out who they were and now earlier this year I had to update my old used car with a newer old used car yeah. and my one rule was it needs to have a CD player <laughs> because I oh, still yeah. enjoy that that version you know yeah same and I think too it's like I when I listen to music even if I listen to a record on streaming like I I literally song by song I go online and I google the the name of the song and the lyrics because I love to sit and listen to something and read what the person is saying like I don't experience music in the way where on a first listen, like I am always just like, okay, I'm going to listen to this album. Now I'm going to sit down. I'm going to give it my time and attention. And I want to see what these people are saying. And I never do shuffle. Like I want to experience a record the way that an artist and a band wants you to experience it. Right. And, you know, it, it's a bummer that it's changed so much, but I do feel like people, there are still a lot of people that like appreciate records, sure. which Absolutely. I'm thankful for. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's, you know, and it's funny because when I especially listen to you talking about other musicians, I wrote down, I was like, I don't know if I ever knew this, but you and I might be musical soulmates. Really? In a way that I don't hear other people because, listen, I love Counting Crows. They're one of my all time favorite bands. The best. I think Recovering the Satellites <laughs> might be one of the greatest albums of all time. I've got it's Stipe so over good. my shoulder here. Oh, I, see. I saw that. Yeah. You know, that's there. Cheryl Crow 
who I you got know, her been, over right. my shoulder. <laughs> yeah, who I've been so lucky to have. Like she's one of my gurus. You know, it's yeah. like Liz Fair, the whole thing. And these are like when you talk about, especially about these artists in context of this album. And a lot of times, of course, we're talking about '90s musicians or their albums from that in the 2000s. Yeah. Like, what is it about? Like, why did you want to lean into that? I guess is is what I was getting at because it really does feel like you leaned into that more than you ever have. Thank you. I think for me, it was really like it was an energy. Like, it's an ener I think when I listen to those classic albums and I listen to that type of music for me it's not just the songwriting because i think the songwriting people weren't right i think it was also an era where people weren't writing songs to be a hit they were just writing the song that they wanted to write and it just so happened that like you know every day is a winding road is the most infectious melody you've ever heard and you hear it at every grocery store and you're like yeah there it is but that's just a testament to cheryl crow's master songwriting you know but I think also there's a real like palpable energy to those records. And that's the music that was on the radio when I was a kid. Like when I was a kid, you know, young, like in the car with my mom or my dad driving somewhere, like I heard REM on the radio. I heard Counting Crows on the radio. I heard the Wallflowers on the radio. Like that is the music that really affected me when I first started paying attention to music. And I just felt like I wanted to make something that like, my you know nine-year-old self would have heard on the radio as a kid and been like turn this up I love it and I, I think Butch Walker my producer he is also a fan of all that stuff and I made him this like master playlist of all of these references and when he when he heard it he was like dude I I've wanted like I me personally as an artist I've wanted to make this record all of this time like you brought me the exact record that I've been wanting to make like these are all the references that I love too so we really got along so well and I think that him too like he really agreed with me when it came to like there's just an energy of that music and I wanted to try to like replicate it and I feel like I succeeded like I I feel I I do like I I'm not always the most confident person but I feel like when I listen to this record I'm like yes I did the exact thing that I wanted to do yeah yeah when I was listening to uh to Calling All Angels which you know has a little bit more of that Americana country vibe yeah to, and remembering like you know the VH1 era as we're talking about <laughs> You know, there was still the, the word alternative was thrown around with a lot of these bands, but they were doing more of, you know, a, a twangier version, yeah. not exactly, you know, Wilco style, but not far off at that point. And it, it, like you really did hit that sweet spot because that's an interesting line to toe to still have that that version of alternative and that version of country at the same time. <laughs> you know, thanks. I think also I wasn't thinking so much about what was cool because that's just not me like I'm not a person that's ever going to be like oh this is the cool new sound I need to follow that like I'm always going to make the thing that I think is cool that I feel connected to and I you know kind of similar to what I was just saying about those albums like I wasn't like of course I want my records to be successful and I want songs to do well but I wasn't sitting there being like is this going to deliver on TikTok it's just like no I was writing I was writing music that like I want to put on in my car with the windows down and listen to. And I also didn't want anything to feel, I wanted the record to feel like it had a lot of different colors and a lot of different sounds. And I think from song to song, it is like not every single song sounds the same. Like everything kind of has its own vibe. It comes from its own place. And I think a song like Calling All Angels for me was like, I really was like, I want to make like a 90s my version of like a 90s country song mm -hmm. and again I think I succeeded <laughs> I'm no. becoming more and more confident by way of this interview <laughs> I'm really glad I could be here for this on this front row seat uh when you have access to the type of friends that you have who might also be heroes you know whether it's you got the Cheryl Crow behind you and you know Shirley Manson I know that's a mutual friend yeah uh, and like do do you reach out? Do you reach out for the do you get guidance from them as well? Because because that's the fun moment of of having a career like this, I think. Yeah, you know, I I I wouldn't say that I necessarily there are certain people that I reach out to. There are definitely I mean, Haley is a huge one, but I actually have 
next to my desk, I have a framed interaction, a Twitter interaction between me and Shirley, because I had posted something on Twitter where I had said like, you know, something about journaling, how journaling always kind of helps me like get all of the junk out of my head that is essentially my inner critic attacking me. And I said something where I was like, it's so wild how you can wake up one day and just be like, I'm a loser husband. No one likes me or cares about me. And then you journal for three minutes and you feel fine. And she like wrote back and was like, stop talking to yourself like that. Your words have power. And I was like, I'm trying. I'm literally looking at it. And she says, good girl, keep it up. What we say to ourselves has so much power. So stop saying that shit or else your Scottish mummy will be very cross. <laughs> and I was like, I'm printing this shit out. I'm putting it next to my desk because it's such a good reminder. And also like Shirley is a great example. You know, Liz Fair is also a friend of mine. Like these women have been in this industry for so long and have gone through so much mm -hmm. and existed in the nineties when everything was so misogynistic and they were just constantly being poked and prodded for like not being enough or being too much. And I think that like, it feels really nice to look at them and be like, you're still here. Like you made it through the fucking wilderness of all of this. And I feel really grateful to have people around me that will tweet at me and be like, don't talk about yourself or I'm going to come over there and I'm going to like, you know, like snap, slap you on the hand. <laughs> I mean, we're lucky to have these heroes. I think we're lucky to have the heroes yeah. that we did at the time that they, they came out, you know, and, yeah, and I'm yeah. I'm really grateful too that my career has I have I mean I have really collaborated with the majority of I mean like Best Coast has opened for basically every band that meant the world to me in high school. Blink 182, Green Day, no doubt. Like Weezer, I wrote a song with Rivers Cuomo. Like I really do look back on my life and go like, damn, I this is this is a good this is a good life. <laughs> and you know what that means? That means you're an icon. <laughs> thank you <laughs> so you know you, you you take all this out how much of a hard line in the sand do you pull live now I mean are, are you keeping it mostly the new stuff do you bring the best coast songs along or do you say that's on a rest you know I I as I I have a show in LA at the Troubadour in September and then I'm gonna go do a show in Denver um and that's kind of like where I'm at I'm trying to figure out like touring and plans mm. for the future and all of that but, you know, I've thought about it and I don't feel, I think if I do any Best Coast stuff, I will do it totally solo on my own and just probably like play it acoustic or something. It doesn't feel right to me to get up and play a Best Coast song as a full band. Like Bob is such a, he's such an important piece of the Best Coast puzzle. And obviously like he is like family to me and I would never want to do anything where it's like, oh, Bob is replaceable because he's not. And he is super, super, super supportive of what I'm doing, which is so nice because I had so much anxiety about telling him like, hey, I feel ready to go do my own thing. And he literally just looked at me and was like, okay, like, why would I be mad at you for that? You know? And when I announced this, there were like a few bullshit tweets and things where people were like, how could you do this to Bob? And it's like, I just had to remember like, these people don't know the story and people always want to make drama out of something, but there is absolutely no drama at all. He and I are really brother and sister, but, and because of that too, like I really would feel like playing the songs without him in a full band capacity would be weird. So I think if I do it, I'll play them the way that they were written, which is just me on my own, you know? Plus you've, uh, you, you've already shown us, you got an arsenal of covers, I think at your disposal. Oh. So, uh... Yeah, thanks. I think that, you know, that's been a really exciting thing, like trying to figure out too, like, sorry that my AirPod popped out. Um, trying to figure out the songs of this era that kind of influenced this album and informed the sound and the energy. Like what of those songs could I cover? And that's a really exciting thing for me because I can't wait to like figure out the touchstones of what I can add to a set to sort of like bring it all together and give it some context. And isn't that exciting that you get to start over with that again, like from point A? Like, yeah, it is. It is. It's it's really, you know, and also the thing about this record is I think that I I sing on it in a way in which I've never sung before. And I think that a lot of that was I held myself back vocally with Best Coast. I think with each record, it sort of progressed and got a little clearer and a little bit more obvious that I actually know how to sing very well. But I 
never really felt with Best Coast that I could like just come out and write a song that allowed me to like dip low, low, low into my range, high, high, high into my range. Like I just felt like the formula was what it was. And so with this, I'm so excited to get to like perform and just like sing. Cause that is what I really, at the end of the day, like I am a singer songwriter. I, you know, I play the guitar, but I don't consider myself to be like a great guitar player. I know enough to, you know, to accompany myself, but it just feels like it's going to be really exciting for me to like walk up to a mic and just be like, ha. Ah. <laughs> It, did I read it right? Like I had no clue that you were opera trained. Is that is that true? Yeah. Yes, I took opera lessons in. I took opera lessons from the second grade to the fourth grade. So I was a kid, but I remember so much of the technique that I was taught. And my opera teacher was the. She was the coolest. She looked like Elvira. She had like long black hair, and she had like tattooed like lip lip liner, oh. and she had this tortoise that lived at her house and would just walk around the house like while we were doing up while I was doing my lessons um and she was like she was hardcore like she was if I would come in and I wouldn't have practiced like I would hear it from her so I really like and that's really the only so I took guitar lessons piano lessons all that stuff but singing was like the one thing that I was like super super invested in and really wanted to do um but yeah it is kind of funny to be like I'm a opera I was trained in opera as a kid and like the first my first ever album you can barely hear my voice <laughs> <laughs> like if my opera teacher heard that she's probably like what what is yeah. happening <laughs> I mean that was the that's the story of so many greats you know I referenced Stipe again it was all it was the mumble thing for the first yeah. albums you know and then you know whatever but yeah he least... has one of the he has I think my favorite like male voice mm. his voice is so incredible yeah so incredible yeah. Your sounds great. The songwriting Thanks. on this record is so damn good. Thank uh, you. I did laugh that, you know, <clears throat> you writing this a couple of years ago and thinking about the world environmentally. And now here we are as the record's coming out and it's literally the hottest literally. summer ever. Like, Yeah, I know. <sighs> I, I've i joked about this in many an interview over the years, but I do think that I have a little bit of the power to know what's coming yeah. like I do feel like I have a little bit of like a psychic vibe or something but you know th that and the song natural disaster is very much a commentary on the way in which we all just go about our lives while the world behind us sort of burns and I hope that the song you know being a bit of like a bop as the kids would say and having a catchy chorus and something you can move around to like I hope that it being digestible in that way will make people stop and listen and be like, oh, she's talking about the world literally ending and like how we as people, like we pay attention to things that don't have anything to do with us, but the actual things that have to do with us, like we don't, and it's like climate change is a product of humanity, right? And billionaires and corporations and all of these things. But yeah, I, I, I was excited about that one because I was excited about tackling like a big topic, but sort of putting it in a way where people probably will just be like this is a sick song and then when they listen they'll be like oh 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 right. yeah that's that's real <laughs> those are fun you pull back those layers and you're like well that's dark yeah so i like singing. doing that yeah. i like to do um a happy song with uh, intense lyrics <laughs> it's a good trick i hope your premonitions eventually start being positive that could be really helpful for us so. you know I hope so too. I, it's, it's, it's really, it's really insane. And I think all of us are probably living with, you know, horrible anxiety about what is to come. And I just do my best, you know, I'm only one person and I'm not perfect, but I do my best to sort of like do little things when, and, you know, when and how I can. And I really want to do some partnerships with this record with organizations, climate change organizations that are helping, you know, to, slow the role of what's happening um but yeah I I hope that maybe one of these days I'll wake up and like my premonition will be that like all the horrible conservatives get blasted into space and they never come back <laughs> I'll let you know if that one I'm waiting for that me. song the moment I hear that song I'm gonna know that's it that's it that's it <laughs> maybe just build it and they will come you know I don't yeah maybe yeah a manifestation song maybe I'll do that yeah try that out 
Bethany, it's always so much fun to talk to you. Congratulations on this record. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk about it. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And thanks to my guest. Also, thanks to you for uh, for checking out the episode in the series. Before you get out of here, hit that subscribe button. Again, uh, you get three brand new interviews every single week. New and every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at uh, right here on YouTube or, of course, anywhere in podcast land, including iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Podchaser, NPR, or WFPK.org as well. A great way to keep up with your favorite artists and discover new ones as well. Then after that, actually head over to WFPK.org. That's where I do a show, Monday through Friday, 6 p.m. Eastern. It's an hour full of song premieres, music news, anniversary spins, bonus interviews, Monday through Friday, 6 p.m. Eastern at WFPK.org. Consequence has your music and film news. You can also find me on the social media spots, uh, Facebook, Instagram, mostly on Twitter. All three of them, the address is at Kyle Meredith. Do hope you like and follow along. That does it for another edition. I'm Kyle Meredith. I'll see you next time.